Hello, and welcome to another episode of My Two Cent. My name is Paul Anderson, and I'll be giving you My Two Cent. Today's subject matter is going to be on, well, it's on the board, right? Fear and its influence on the learning process, right? So, and I also have some other random stuff that I want to address due to the mainness that I'm dealing with with work. So I'll start, I'll open with this stuff and then we'll get back to the actual subject matter, which is fear and its influence on the learning process. So this is the second video that's going to form the foundation of every video that's going to come. Every video is going to, going to in of itself serve as a proof against the last video and a continuation to progress the overall learning process. So, um, these are random, so I'm just gonna read them as they are. The person who takes charge is a manager. A manager, is there a page for this? Yes, there's a page for this, okay. A leader is not the person in charge or the A leader is not the person in charge or the person that takes charge. A leader is a leader is the person who is accountable. The person who takes charge is a manager. A manager is not always a leader, and a leader is not always a manager. If the person in charge does not take accountability, they are a bully. A bully is anyone who is not accountable but expects to be acknowledged as a leader. Self-governing is the management of oneself. Those are just random thoughts dealing with crazy people who have worked at a defect. Um, it's relevant to the overall scope of just normal everyday life when we're dealing with each other and interacting with each other and being held accountable for other people's actions, which is heavily influenced by this All right so this this right here in my opinion is the foundation of why we feel as a species in the present day because these books I was raised with this one particularly I was raised Christian and these particular books only serve to perpetuate the thing which they are intended to eliminate and in my opinion that makes them invalid because if you're supposed to be teaching people how to be better and your principles is making them worse or at the very least under the guidance of the instructions the instructions themselves seem to fail then what is there I mean at what point do you start realizing that maybe this is the actual problem and not the individual themselves with that being said we'll come back to this Fear. Fear is the emotional response to unknown threat or danger. Curiosity is the emotional response to the unknown. So what does that mean? That means, oh, and I replaced the glasses. So I gotta go on now because one of my favorite uh, my, my single fan, I should say, recommended them, so they're coming back. They were always going to come back, but I kind of left them in Michigan. It's kind of hard to put glasses on when you don't have them next to you. Um, okay, so what does that mean? And how is that, how is that in relation to this? And how does Christianity fit into this? When, you're, when we are born, we are born ignorant. We are born with no knowledge of the external world and no capacity through which to communicate um, our needs, our wants, or our desires. The human infant, which is, the, is the, the very basic and most primitive state of the human condition, is very dependent on external resources right 
So we were born at, uh, at the mercy of our parents, for lack of a better word, at the mercy of other people. But to keep it simple, we'll say we're born at the mercy of our parents. So as we grow and become, a, and become consciously aware of our existence and experience the emotional uh, palette of the human, con the human condition, fear, anxiety, love, happiness, sorrow, depression, etc. As we grow and we evolve and we learn these things, we ultimately develop the acknowledgement of things being and things ceasing. And as we acknowledge that things can be and things can cease, we develop fear. We are afraid of a lack of existence. Our greatest fear is the ceasing of self, death, for lack of better words. Considering the fact that human beings are destined to die, the idea that fear is imaginary is invalid if this individual is not immortal. You can't claim that fear is, in, is not a real thing to a living organism that must maintain its homostasis because the very nature of existence is to perpetuate the longevity of one's existence. So as you evolve in higher thinking and reasoning, you start to acknowledge through forethought that there are ways to perpetuate the longevity of your life. And through that, you develop fear. Now, in our culture, fear is the result of this. This is where all of our fears come from. They're all put into us to make us obedient with this book. Because it's a lot easier to control a free-willed human being by creating shackles in their mind built out of fear. Don't go outside because you might die. Don't play with the water. Don't play in the water bathtub because you might slip and fall and die. It's a lot easier to utilize fear as a teaching mechanism to young children to get them to be compliant to your preconceived idea of how they should be instead of allowing them to develop and evolve into the beings that they are going to choose to be. And it is through that that we develop unnecessary fear. All of the negative mental consequences of our fears. Instead of growing in a way that we would outgrow... Let me put it like this. If you believe that there's monsters under your bed because you're a child, you're afraid of the unknown possibility that there are monsters under your bed but through enough experience in life you will realize that there really are no monsters under your bed they're only illusions of your mind now the threat of something being under your bed is extremely valid but the security of your of your house your room and your bed as a sanctuary should sufficiently invalidate those things but you but we have been taught to fear monsters and acknowledge that gods will protect us from these imaginary threats. So if the God that's protecting me from a threat is real, then a threat itself must also be real. You can't separate the two. And it is from this that we unfortunately develop the type of psychological issues that we ultimately develop later in life as we get older. The religions come into play because we are taught, especially in Christianity, that wrongness is ungodly. And we are and if you're born ignorant and to be wrong is to violate God's laws. Basically, 
we are indirectly taught that if you make a mistake, you're going to go to hell. If you do the wrong thing, you're going to go to hell. If you're bad, you're going to go to hell. So, in all of these cases, you have children that want to maintain their spiritual homostasis and not go to an eternity of fire and damnation that don't want to be wrong. So then you grow up with the illusion or the ego of absolute rightness so that you can ensure that you will go to heaven. You will defend that through deception and lies to self to make sure that you're not going to go to hell. You don't even realize as a child because you don't know the difference of how detrimental that is to your long-term thinking process. So when you go to school and you're being taught principles of mathematics and English and spelling and writing, and it's difficult because your young mind has a hard time grasping concepts that are foreign to its most basic function, which is to make sure your heart works, make sure your kidneys work, make sure your liver works, make sure that you are eating enough calories so that you can run from lions and tigers and bears. When you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher's telling you about the alphabets and the numbers and the colors, you don't care. You know, so it's not relevant to the most pressing concerns of the undeveloped human mind. But it's efficient for a society, yes, it's efficient for a society and a family to utilize those tools of fear to perpetuate the idea that you will go to hell to keep you in check. You could tell your children, if you don't behave, you're not going to get presents for Christmas, and it'll behave. So, I mean, that, that works. You can't sit down and logically have a conversation with them and say, you're getting on my... You're getting on my last nerve running around being childish because you're a child. Because they'll say, well, I'm a child. That's what children do. You know. But I'm rambling. So, in Christianity, we're taught that that, that uh, if you disobey God's laws, you go to hell. Right? But then we're also taught that children automatically go to heaven because they're ignorant. They can't be held accountable for their actions because they're not knowledgeable of what they do. So as, as our children evolved from this state of innocence into accountability, because they're taught that the innocence keeps you safe from the wrath of God, but the evolution from that to acknowledgement of right and wrong in the self makes you accountable. What has happened in our culture is that we try to stay ignorant to remain innocent. They're not the same thing. Ignorance is the lacking of knowledge. Innocence is the lack of accountability. If you're not accountable, then you're innocent. If you are lacking in knowledge and you are ignorant. They are not the same thing. So this is how I influence the learning process because if I'm going to go to school and I'm going to be taught that I need to learn these principles and give good grades and I'm a young child and you give me these math problems and I write the answers to all of them and I give it to you and I turn it in I'm all happy and excited because I did math and then you give it back to me and you say you did these wrong well, wrong is a trigger word. I don't want to be wrong because I don't want to go to hell. Go do them again. Okay? I didn't, like, I'm going to just do the same thing I did last time because I haven't learned anything you're supposed to teach me. So now it's time for the teacher to sit down and re-explain the principles to you so that you can understand, come to an understanding of what you need to do. But through the process of failing to learn and being taught that failure is ungodly, the bias of learning is developed. And that is basically the influence of, the, of fear through the learning process because I'm afraid to be a failure. And I don't want to have to deal with being accountable for not being knowledgeable. I don't want to have to learn things and develop 
a better understanding of the world that I live in because I was told that if I do so, then my actions will cause me to be judged by God and I could potentially go to hell. And every time I get a bad grade in school, even if I don't go to hell for it, my parents are going to punish me. I'm not going to be able to play my toys. I'm not going to be able to go outside. And it's through this, as our children evolve and grow, that the learning process becomes stagnated because we have too many cultural influences that directly influence the ideas and principles that make it easier for children to learn and grow. The rules of math and the rules of syntax and language are simple to understand when they're not corrupted. They're very simple. I mean, like, my, my biggest pet peeve in life is one plus one equals two. One plus one equals two. I have one dot and one dot. Together I have two dots. There is no three there. There is no one. I can have one set of dots. I have one set of dots. If I have another set of dots, they can still be one set of dots. But if I add them together, I have either two total sets of dots or I can find them all and then I have four dots. These are the principles of mathematics. That's how they always work. That's how they will always work. The logic of math is absolute. You can argue with it. You can fight against it. But all you're ultimately doing is corrupting your own thinking process to make things, un to make things more difficult for yourself later. If you meet Tina and Joe, you didn't meet one person, did you? Are they the same person? Is Tina and Joe the same person? I mean, unless Tina and Joe is that individual's name, Tina, we can assume it's female because it's the feminine, and Joe, we can assume it's male because it's the masculine. If the feminine and the masculine are not the same pe person, and I know we live in this world of all this gender neutrality, but if the the person with the f female sex organs and the person with the male sex organ cannot be the same individual, then one Tina and one Joe has to equal two people, right? It can't equal one person. This is wrong, right? But again, if you've been taught that being wrong and thinking wrong will make you go to hell, then you will engage in mental gymnastics, what I like to refer to as mental masturbation, to make anything valid in your mind. Because the human imagination can imagine anything as correct. The best analogy that I always use is because I've seen birds fly, I can imagine a person flying, but humans will never fly without any type of extreme changes in our physical our physiology. We can hop in airplanes and fly, but we will never just jump off the ground like Superman and fly. It's as, as sad as it is, it's true. But it's a very sobering truth at some point, in, in some way. Because knowing your own limitations means that you can invest energy into areas that will actually be applicable in some way. I could spend my entire life trying to learn how to fly. I could dedicate my ego to mastering flight. But I will, hold up, I will have wasted a hundred years of life trying to achieve something that is impossible. Or I can acknowledge at a very young age that flying in that way is not possible. But flying in of itself as observed through animals on this planet that can fly and through the, the process of throwing rocks through the air is achievable in some manner. And then I can apply the principles of science to that understanding and then potentially learn how to build an aerodynamic vehicle or a Newtonian rocket and get off this planet. And with that, I'm not going to ramble anymore. And I guess I'll have to deal with this book a little bit later because it didn't fit in the context of this particular video. So as always, my name is Paul Emerson, and that was my two cents.